أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لسانه أفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So inshallah for today's halakah I'm going to be going over we're going to be, we're going to be going over a lot of things so I want to get started as soon as we can and I'm going to be picking off where I left off in the last halaqa and I was going over the signals of the khilafa of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu and why he was the one who was destined to be the next khalifa and I'm going to mention some of the signals I mentioned in the last halaqa just a few of them I mentioned how a woman came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam with an inquiry and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told her to come to me at a later time. And then she said, what if you are not here at that later time? Intending by it that what if you have passed away at that time? And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if I am not here, then go to Abu Bakr as siddiq And then another narration I mentioned was, um, was how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu lead the people in praying and he did not allow anyone else to lead them while Abu Bakr was amongst them and then third I mentioned the narration of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu who mentions that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that while I was sleeping I saw myself standing at a well and at that well I was using a bucket to draw water and after I had done so, I passed the bucket over to Abu Bakr as siddiq radiallahu anhu. And then after he had drawn water, then he passed the bucket over to Umar radiallahu anhu. And then we mentioned that the interpretation of this hadith, that the passing of the bucket signaled the passing of the leadership of the ummah. The first it was supposed to be Abu Bakr, and then it was supposed to be Umar. And this hadith was mentioned in both Bukhari and Muslim. And so to end with the signals of the Khilafah, I will mention some hadith that involve Ali radiallahu anhu and his opinion. And I do this because we know that there is a strand outside of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah who say that it was Ali radiallahu anhu instead who deserved to be the Khilaf, who deserved to be the Khalifa. And they will make up lies about Abu Bakr as siddiq And they will say that he instead oppressed and so I want to mention some of the narrations attributed to Ali radiallahu anhu. And I want to start by saying that perhaps Ali radiallahu anhu did have a thought that he might get the role of leadership. However, and this is important to remember, that he always supported Abu Bakr. And when Abu Bakr got it, he gave the bay'ah to him. He pledged his allegiance to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And he worked under him, Umar and Uthman, as a qadi, meaning as a judge. And he always supported the Sahaba. And so you see, we give him the respect he deserves more than the Shia themselves because we respect him as he would have wanted us to respect him. And also remember that Ali radiallahu anhu at this time was in his early 30s. So some say he was 30, some say he was 32. While Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was 59, almost 60 years old. And at this time the ummah needed someone who had experience, who was older to lead this new ummah. Because the ummah was still young and it needed someone like Abu Bakr as-Siddiq to lead it. And Ali radiallahu anhu had a time decreed for him. It was not right now, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a time decreed for him when he would take on the role of leadership over the ummah. And so I'll go over a few hadith. So Al-Bukhari rahimullah, he narrates from Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he says that I said to my father, who is the best of mankind after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? And Ali said, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And then Muhammad ibn Abi Talib asks, then who? And then Ali radiallahu anhu says, then Umar. And now his son, so it's his son and he's asking his father. So he wants his father to be his hero, kind of. He wants to put his father on a pedestal. So Muhammad ibn Abi Talib, he says, that I would have asked the same question again. But I was afraid that he would say Uthman. So I asked, then you? 
And then Ali radiallahu anhu replies that I am nobody but a man amongst the Muslims. And Imam Ahmed and others narrated Ali said, The best of this ummah after a prophet are Abu Bakr and Umar. And Imam al-Dhahibi rahimahullah has said that this narration is mutawatir from Ali. Meaning that there are multiple lines of, multiple chains of narration attributing the statement to Ali radiallahu anhu. And I'll mention one more where it talks about Abu Sufyan radiallahu anhu who had become Muslim. And scholars say that at the beginning stages of Abu Sufyan's acceptance, he hadn't fully, he, Islam had entered, but it had not fully entered into his soul. So he was still having some misgivings about it. And Imam al Dhahibi declared the following uh, hadith sahih that Murra al Tayyib rahimullah he narrates that Abu Sufyan came to Ali and said that what is it with this authority that is among the very least of Quraysh and the humblest among, amongst them? Meaning that what is it that this Khalafa is with Abu Bakr as Siddiq? And does anyone remember the tribe that Abu Bakr as Siddiq was from? The name of that tribe. So that tribe was Banu Taym. And Banu Taym, it wasn't one of the noble tribes of the Quraysh. Like we know the Banu Hashim, we know the Banu Umayyah. These were pretty much the noble tribes. The Banu Taym was a pretty small tribe. It wasn't amongst the nobility. And so this is what Abu Sufyan radiallahu anhu, because he was a Sahaba, this is what he is talking about. And so he says, by Allah, if you had wished, and if I wished, I would have filled this wall against him with you. So I would have filled it with horses and, and men, meaning that I would have fought for this position with you against Abu Bakr. And upon hearing this, Ali radiallahu anhu, he replies, that, O oh Abu Sufyan, how long have you been at enmity with Islam and its people? And that did not hurt it at all. Rather, we have found Abu Bakr worthy of the Khilafah. And so he is defending Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And I'll end off with this one narration by Abu Bakr al-Shafi'i rahimahullah in his book Al-Ghaylaniyat. He mentions the Hafsa radiallahu anha mentioned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that she asked him that when you were ill, you gave precedence to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Meaning you gave him precedence in that you made him the Imam of the people. That you made, them, that you made him lead the Ummah in Salah. And then the Prophet وسلم, upon hearing this, he says, I am not the one that gives precedence to him. Rather, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave precedence to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And now I'll mention some of the merits of Abu Bakr. You know, there's honestly a whole list. Even Imam al-Sayyuti rahimahullah, he has pages filled with merits. I just picked out a couple that I'll go over. So. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he mentioned in, in a hadith that the companions surrounded the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that they were sitting in front of him, and the Messenger of Allah says to them that who of you is fasting today? And Abu Bakr says, I am. And then he says, who amongst you has followed a funeral procession today? And Abu Bakr said, I have. And then the Prophet ﷺ says that who amongst you has fed a poor person today? And again, Abu Bakr says, I have. And then the Prophet says, who amongst you has visited a sick person today? And again, Abu Bakr said, I have. And then upon hearing this, the Prophet ﷺ says, that, O Abu Bakr, Jannah has become obligatory upon you. That Jannah, that paradise has become fard upon you, O Abu Bakr. And I'll mention one more, since I want to make sure we get through everything. This following hadith is narrated by Abu, Abu Darda radiallahu anhu. And he says that again, we were sitting around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That there was a halaqa, a gathering, and the sahaba surrounded the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came. And he came in quickly into the gathering, holding on to his thobe, and coming in rather quickly. And upon seeing, seeing this, the Prophet said that your companion has been in a quarrel. He said this to the Sahaba who were in front of him. And number one, this shows how just by looking at Abu Bakr, he was able to tell what had happened. 
that this was the sort of friendship he had and the sort of friendship that we should strive to have that just by looking at his companion he could tell that something had happened and so Abu Bakr al-Siddiq he greeted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then he says that there was something meaning a quarrel between me and the son of Al-Khattab meaning between me and Umar there was somewhat of a quarrel and so I talked to him harshly and then I regretted doing that and I asked him to forgive me but Umar would not forgive me and upon hearing this the Prophet ﷺ, he says the following he said this three times he said يَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لَكَ يَا أَبَا بَكْرٍ يَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لَكَ يَا أَبَا بَكْرٍ he said this three times meaning O oh Abu Bakr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven you O oh Abu Bakr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven you and he said this three times without even hearing what had happened without even hearing Umar's side of the story without even hearing the whole story he said O oh Abu Bakr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven you and it is narrated that while this was happening Umar radiallahu anhu he regretted not forgiving Abu Bakr and so he went to his house and he saw his family but his family said that Abu Bakr is not here he is with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and so Umar went to meet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the masjid and when he went there he greeted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam but signs of displeasure appeared on the face of the Prophet and the companions around him saw this as well now the Prophet looked at Umar and he had a face of anger on him and so he sat down and there was an air of tension at this time and they were all sitting in silence and, uh, and the Prophet ﷺ had signs of displeasure on his face and again look at the character of Abu Bakr he felt this tension and wallahi if only we had this characteristic of his which is empathy that he put himself in the shoes of Umar seeing how the Prophet ﷺ was angry at him and so Abu Bakr got on his knees he stood up on his knees and he pled for Umar for to make a case for Umar he says the O Messenger of Allah I was more unjust to him than he was to me and so he's making shifa'a for the cause of Umar radiallahu anhu and upon hearing this the Prophet ﷺ says that Allah sends me as a prophet to you people but you said to me that you are telling a lie illa except for Abu Bakr for when I came to him he said that you are telling the truth and he has helped me with his time as well as with his wealth and then the Prophet ﷺ said the following statement twice he says فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ تَارِكُ لِي صَاحِبِي فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ تَارِكُ لِي صَاحِبِي that won't you then stop harming my companion now won't you then stop annoying my companion and Abu Darda radiallahu anhu he ends his hadith by stating that after this fact no one harmed Abu Bakr and this is why it is important to remember even for us that we value all the Sahaba and that we do not let other people speak ill about the Sahaba and especially about Abu Bakr as siddiq radiallahu anhu and now we'll move on to his Khilafah so right when he assumed the role of leadership there was a disagreement upon where to bury the Prophet ﷺ. some of the Sahaba said that we will bury him in Mecca his birthplace and others said no in his mosque others said in Al-Baqi and then others said in Bayt Al-Maqdis which is the burial ground of the prophets until Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu he remembered a hadith and he told them rather the Prophet ﷺ told me that no Prophet dies but that he's buried underneath the bed upon which he passed away and so he was buried within the house of Aisha radiallahu anha and now I'll move on to the wars of Ridda the wars of apostasy so since the Ummah was rather new there were small pockets of different tribes in, Ar in Arabia who said they would pray but they would not pay the zakat and their reasoning for this was they interpreted they said that the zakat was only commanded to be given under the leadership of the Prophet ﷺ. and we see this nowadays too where a lot of the times we have progressives who reinterpret the ayahs of the Quran who reinterpret hadith which is why it is so important to go back to the scholars of the past 
to go back to the Salaf, to go back to the ulama who dedicated their whole life onto doing this and make sure we follow their opinions and not just the minority opinions based off, based off of our whims and our desires. And because of this, the religion has become strong and it has remained strong since the very beginning. And we see Umar radiallahu anhu, he told Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he says this ummah is so new, so be gentle in dealing with them. However, Abu Bakr replied that he would not grant any sort of license when it comes to the religion. And because of this, the religion has remained strong. And the Sahaba agreed that at this time, sternness was required. And so they fought them until these tribes they paid their zakat. And I'll mention a few of the false prophets. So there was a few of the big ones and I'll mention these ones. There were other ones as well that emerged. The number one is Tulayha al-Asadi. Tulayha al-Asadi, who fought against the Prophet Sallallahu at the Battle of Ahzab. And Abu Bakr Sadiq sent Khalid ibn Walid to battle him. And a man like Khalid was, no one in the world at this time could match up with him. And Tulayha was gathering many tribes to fight alongside him. And Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu moved northwards in order to meet him in battle. And when he reached a place known as Salma, he entered into negotiations with the tribe that held power over the region. And this tribe was known as the Banu Ta'i. The Banu Ta'i. And the chieftain of this tribe was Adi ibn Hatim, the son of Hatim at Ta'i. Now I want to ask, has anyone heard of this name before? The name is Hatim at Ta'i. Alright, so Hatim at Ta'i, he was one of, if not the most famous Arab at that time. He had passed away before Islam, but he was a celebrity pretty much, whose stories and legends continue to be passed down even until today. He was known for his extreme generosity, selflessness, as well as his poems. And everyone knew about his generosity. Stories were written about it. And even the Arabs in Mecca knew about this person called Hatim at Ta'i. And one of the Proverbs, Proverbs that I'm not sure if it's used much now, but it was used a lot in the past. And some of my friends know that I'll use this proverb too, sometimes sarcastically, where people say that I'm Akram bin Hatim, that I am more generous than Hatim. Because that is what he was known by. And sometimes I'll use this one too. And honestly, he's now more famous in the subcontinent, which is actually something interesting that in Pakistan and India, if you go, like a lot of the elderly, they will know about his name because there has been so many movies made about him back. I was checking, there were like 10 movies made about him in the 1900s alone in India. And they call him Hatim Tai. So they kind of changed his name. So honestly, if any of you guys know, have, or if, you, if any of you guys are Desi, go home and ask your parents about Hatim Tai because they might actually know about him as well. So Adi was his son, Adi ibn Hatim at Ta'i, and the new leader of the tribe when his father had passed away. And he was still extremely popular because of his father. And at the time of the Prophet wasallam, while when Islam was growing fast, he fled to Syria. So he left to Syria, and he had a sister, Safana, who accepted Islam and saw how amazing the Muslims lived, how amazing they treated her and so she accepted Islam and sent a letter to her brother Adi urging him to, go, to come back to Medina and that the people would be pleased to see him. And so he arrived in Medina and everyone recognized him. Like he was a celebrity. Even though he was the son of a famous person, he was still a celebrity. And they all went to go meet him and he was very well received. And so he reached the Prophet Wasallam, and he was invited to Islam. And the Prophet said that he knew his religion better than he did. So here the Prophet is giving him da'wah and he is calling him to Islam. And one of the ways he did this is, I will teach you your religion, showing you how much knowledge I have. And so he knew that his religion, he was not a Christian. So Adi, he was not fully a Christian. He is something we call a Rukusi. And Rukusi is a blend of Christianity as well as other religions. And Adi was surprised at the Prophet's knowledge. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he, here I'll mention this as well since it's interesting. That the Prophet foretold three prophecies to Adi. He says, perhaps our oh Adi, the only thing that prevents you from accepting this religion is that you see that the Muslims are small in number 
compared to the enemy. Perhaps there will come a time, Wallahi, the time is near, when you would hear of a woman setting out from Qadisiyah, from Yemen, with no one to protect her except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until she reaches Mecca. And then he says, another prophecy, he says, Perhaps what prevents you from accepting this religion is that you see sovereignty and power lies in the hands of the enemy. But wallahi, there will come a time when the doors of Babylon will be opening up for the Muslims. And then a third prophecy, he says, Perhaps already, the only thing that prevents you from accepting this religion is that you see that the Muslims are in a state of destitution and poverty. Rather, wallahi, there will come a time when the Muslims will look around to find a person to give charity, to give zakat to, but they will not find anyone to give it to. And it is narrated that during the, t- during the reign of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Adi himself, he would say that I have seen two of these prophecies come fulfilled with my own two eyes. And he says that I have seen a woman setting out from Qadisiyah and reaching Mecca all by herself. And he says that I have seen with my own eyes the doors of Babylon opening up for the Muslims. And the third prophecy, some say about there not being any Muslim to give zakat to. Some scholars say that this was achieved during the reign of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, who was the eighth Umayyad Khalifa. And so now we come back to the story. So when Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu reached Salma, Remember this is the story that we're continuing. He saw Adi, who remember was a Muslim, but his tribe was not yet a Muslim. And so he asked him to stop his army from joining that of Tulayha al-Asadi. And after a lot of effort, he succeeded, and the surrounding tribes as well, they stopped supporting Tulayha al-Asadi. Just because Adi ibn Hatim stopped, which shows how much power he had because of his celebrity status. And this helped Khalid ibn Walid a ton. And so, Tulayha, he was defeated in battle and he fled. And later on, he accepted Islam. Tulayha al-Asidi, later on, he accepted Islam. And so, I want to mention one narration about him, which is narrated in the Mashari' al-Ashwaq, which is a book of jihad, one of the greatest books of jihad, written by Imam Ibn Nuhas, rahimahullah. He writes that Tulayha Amr and Qais ibn Makshuh went on a reconnaissance mission to the enemy's army. And both Amr and Qais kidnapped some Persian soldiers. So, one of the captured Persians, he narrates the following story. He says, I have fought numerous battles, but I have never seen anyone like this man. And here he is referencing Tulayha al-Asadi. He said that he crossed our camps until he made it to where even the brave would not dare enter. It was the camp of our army's commander, which had 70,000 soldiers guarding it. And remember that this is a reconnaissance mission, so you're not really supposed to fight in such a mission. You're just supposed to spy, look at the location of the army's commander, commander maybe look at the, the numbers the enemy has. And so when Tulayha figured this out, he took the commander's horse and he began to flee in order to escape. And so the Persian soldier, he continues, he says, that the first of us to follow him was, cursed, was considered among us to be equal to a thousand men, and he killed him. Because remember, the people surrounding the enemy armies, the generals, uh, the general's camp, would be the strongest people of the army. It is his personal bodyguard. And so Tulayha killed him. And then he says, another person saw him and went after him. And he was also one of the strongest people of our army, and Tulayha killed him as well. And then he said, Then I pursued him, and I do not think there was anyone left in the army as strong as me. But when I saw him, I saw death on his hands, and so I surrendered. And upon narrating this story, the man, this Persian soldier, he accepted Islam and fought alongside the Muslims. And Tulayha, he passed away as a martyr in the battle of Nahawand, which was fought against the Persians, the battle of Nahawand. And so we see here how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him, even though he had committed such a grave sin of claiming to be a prophet. And so we see here the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he honored him with the death of a martyr. And so, I want to ask really quick, why do we not consider Tulayha al-Asadi to be a Sahaba? Even though he died a Muslim, and he had seen the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, why is he not considered to be a Sahaba? 
any takers. For Um Because isn't it that we can accept Islam and That's right. So that is the reason because he did see the Prophet وسلم, but he fought him in Ahzab, meaning he was not a Muslim at that time. And in order to be considered a Sahaba, you have to be, you either have to see the Prophet or be in close proximity with him. And you have to accept Islam and then you have to die upon that. So he had not finished one of the three conditions. And I'll go over a couple of the other. So these are the bigger false prophets. It is Sajjah bin al Harith, who was a prophetess, something we have not really heard of, as well as Musaylama al Kadhab, the one whom a lot of us we actually know about. And so Musaylama al Kadhab, he honestly he was a very cunning man. And in terms of war tactics, he was actually pretty smart. He had some sort of intelligence. And so he formed an alliance with Sajjah bint al Harith. And he did this, he wooed her, and he ended up marrying her. And so their strength was almost 40,000. And honestly, I'll mention this as well, that the mahr that he gave to her, and this shows how much he mocked the religion. He said that the mahr I give you is the two salah, salat al-fajr and salat al-isha. And so this, he said, meaning by this that you do not have to pray these two salah. And so why is this ironic? That him giving this mahr to sajjah. Any thoughts? Take a guess. <laughs> Salat al Fajr as well as Salat al Aisha. Mm -hmm. What were you going to say? See? I was going to say that was the hardest prayer for Yeah, him. that's right. There's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he says, Athqal al Salah ala munafiqeen, Salat al Aisha wa Salat al Fajr. That the hardest prayer for the hypocrite is the Salat al Fajr as well as Aisha. And so this shows that they were pretty much hypocrites. And actually it is mentioned about um, Sajjah bint al Harith that later on even she accepted Islam. However, Musaylim al kadhab he never accepted Islam and he died upon his hypocrisy. And so originally Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl was sent to fight him and he was a distinguished general. And there were heavy losses to his army. And then Abu Bakr Siddiq sent Shurahbil ibn Hasana. Shurahbil ibn Hasana. And even he was defeated in battle. So now this new Muslim Ummah has already lost two huge battles and have suffered a lot in these battles. And so who does Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu turn to? Take a guess. After Ikrima lost as well as Shurahbil, who would be the best option to go to? It was again Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu. He was honestly the best general the Muslims had at this time. And he was honestly bouncing around the different, the different enemies. So he'd be fighting the Romans and then he'd be fighting the Persians. And then Abu Bakr says that over here we need you. And so he'd go fight these wars of apostasy. So he'd be fighting all three of them. And in the end he would come out victorious. He would come out victorious against all three armies. You know, I want to go on another another tangent and talk about what is happening right now. That Khalid ibn Walid, his army was 15,000 in number. And Musaylama and Sajjah had an army of 40,000 in number. And, and yet Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu was victorious. And now we see Muslims all over the world going through oppression. We've seen it in Yemen, in China. We see it in Pakistan, in India. And now especially we are seeing it in Palestine. And why is this? Because the men of today are not the men of before. We hear stories of Khalid and we hear stories of Salahuddin and what great generals and men they were. And it brings to my mind a narration I heard of a poet who writes that the people would go to the grave of Salahuddin and they would say, Qum ya Salahuddin, Qum ya Salahuddin, stand O Salahuddin, the people of this ummah need you. The people in Gaza, they need you. The people in Palestine, they need you. The Holy Land, it needs you to liberate it. So stand, O Salahuddin. And even a few days ago, I heard someone say to me, which is what brought this narration into my mind. Someone said to me that if only, if only Khalid ibn Walid were still alive right now with everything that is going on. Mm -hmm. So 
so Shia in general they have Arqan al Arba. So they have four Sahaba that they only consider to be Sahaba. And amongst them is Abu Dhar al Ghafar, the Salman al Farisi, so amongst them. But all the other Sahaba, they do not really consider them to be Sahaba. And so they discredit all of them mainly because they supported the other, khila the other Khalifas before they supported Ali. Radiallahu anhu. So they'll say this about all of them that they were not upon the true faith and that billah that they were not true and that they were not sincere in their faith so they'll say this about Khalid they'll say this about all the other Sahaba as well and so so the story I mentioned about someone a few days ago he mentioned to me that if only Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu were still alive right now and then this is what made me think back to the poet because the poem ends with the poet saying that has the state of this ummah become so bad that has the condition of the men of this ummah become so bad that the living have begun asking the dead for their help that the women have begun started to go to the graves of the dead asking them for their help rather these things happen because the men of today have become weak and we hide behind our academics and we hide behind our work and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for this weakness and to give us ranks in society in the future in which we are able to help the ummah in a big way I mean. and so the, the battle between Khalid ibn Walid and Musaylama al kadhab as well as Sajjah the alliance they had it was a very tough battle and the first day did not go so well and the reason why he is said to be the greatest general is because he was a military genius and that he honestly could not lose there was no one at this time who could match him in his military genius and because he is the one who fought who fought the persians who fought the romans at the same exact time and brought both of them to their knees and he used a flank tactic which if i had a marker i would show you all but it's basically where the main armies are fighting each other and there are contingents of the Muslim army which break off and go to fight the, arm, the opposing army so it's hard to show a flank but I'm sure a lot of you guys can google it so anyway this flank tactic d dealt a huge blow to Musaylama al kadhab and the one who, ad who had the honor of killing Musaylama al kadhab was does anyone know who killed this person? Who was it? Khalid. It was not Khalid, not this time. So the person who killed him was Wahshi, who was the person who had killed anyone know? Hamza. That's right, Hamza ibn Abi, Abi Muttalib. And so we see here that he was old, but just as he had hurt Islam, so too did he hurt Islam in such a big way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him with this. And now I'll go over the issue of Fadak. Now this is somewhat of a controversial issue and in the life of Abu, of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu perhaps requires a little bit more effort to explain correctly and it's only controversial when it comes to outside of Ahl Sunnah pretty much the Shia and so Fadak was a land that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam had acquired without going to war and he acquired it through surrender and this category of wealth is called Fayd not ghanima so ghanima is war booty which is which is obtained after defeating an army and basically the spoils of war so this type of land fate is achieved through peaceful negotiations and so fatima radiallahu anha after the passing of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam felt that she had the right to this land and she had her reasons for it because she was a sahabiyah and obviously she would have her reasons for it However, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu would not let her inherit this land. And his reasoning was a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in which he says that our property, meaning the property of the prophets, cannot be inherited. And whatever we leave behind is given in charity. And there is another hadith which talks about the, what the prophets do leave behind in inheritance. Does anyone know what that is? That's right. So the prophets, their only inheritance is knowledge. And this is why we say that whoever has taken from the whoever has taken this, meaning the inheritance, which is knowledge, has taken a great, great deal. 
which is why it is so important to respect and value the ulama that we have today. And so Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he saw Fatima and the, his reasoning, he said to her, he mentioned this hadith and he said that I would love to do good to the kith and kin of the family of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam more than my own family. So he said that I would love to do good more than I would love to do good to the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam even more so than to my own family. And this shows us that the Sahaba at the end of the day, they were human. And I just mentioned the hadith of Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu having their minor dispute. And so they would have these minor disputes. However, they would never attack each other's faith. And this shows us that even we, we can try and aspire to be like the Sahaba. Because just like us, they were human. And it shows us their humanity. And honestly, when that group outside of Ahl Sunnah, Billah, they attack Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu for this. And they say that he should have given her the land. And first of all, we say that who are you and who were they? That they had their itch they had and who are you to attack them? And not only this, but who else would Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu be preventing from the inheritance after giving this ruling? Does anyone know? Who else is affected by this? So it is his own daughter Aisha radiallahu anha because she was the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam so she would have a right to that inheritance and by giving this ruling he is depriving his his own daughter by this ruling and the Shia a'udhu billah they say that he deprived Fatima of this and that by doing this he did dhulm upon her not realizing that this he, by doing this, that he was preventing even his own daughter from this. And second, even when Ali radiallahu anhu became the Khalifa, even then he did not give this land to the Ahlul Bayt. Because he agreed with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And I will move on. I'll mention briefly the compilation of the Qur'an. So many of the Huffad were passing away in the battles. And I mentioned a lot of them, the wars of apostasy, the wars of Ridda. And a lot of them were, uh, were, a lot of them were being martyred against the Persians as well as the Romans. And in the Battle of Yamama alone, around seventy Huffad passed away. And upon this, Umar radiallahu anhu he urged Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to begin the compilation of the Quran. And so he put Zaid ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu in charge of the compilation. And the first Mus'haf was made by a long and thorough process. And perhaps inshallah we'll come back to this later on in the life and biography of Uthman radiallahu anhu. And now we'll move on to the passing away of Abu Bakr and the appointments of Umar radiallahu anhu. So when Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu became ill, he called companions one by one. And he asked them what they thought about him appointing Umar to be the next Khalifa. And he asked Abdul Rahman ibn Uf, radiallahu anhu, who was one of the most senior, most Sahaba at this time. And Abdul Rahman, he says that you know more than I do about Umar. And then Abu Bakr said, but rather still tell me what do you think about him. And so Abdul Rahman says that if you ask me to say, then I will say this, that he is better than even what you think about him. And then Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anhu, he was also asked. And Uthman also says that he is the best amongst us who is left. And then he asks the rest of the companions. And one of the companions, so he asked Abu Bakr Sadiq, he asks, that what will you say to your Lord when he asks you about your appointments of Umar as the, as the Khalifa over us, when you have seen his toughness? So you see Umar radiallahu anhu, he had this, tough, he had this toughness and he had a different sort of temperament. And then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he understood this question. And he says, by Allah, Wallahi, are you trying to frighten me? For Wallahi, I will say that, oh Allah, I appointed to them a Khalifa who was the best amongst them. And so this was basically the appointment of Umar radiallahu anhu. And when he was nearing his death, his daughter Aisha radiallahu anha was near him and he was telling her how to split the inheritance 
and I briefly mentioned the story last time and he told her to distribute it to her two brothers and two sisters and now Aisha radiallahu anha was confused and she said my only sister is who was the only sister that she had at that time anyone remember so it was Asma bint Abi Bakr who had the nickname Zatan Nitaqeen the owner of the two belts and so Aisha radiallahu anha she was confused and she said that Asma is my only sister so what do you mean my two brothers and my two sisters and so Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu he replied that I have a feeling that there is a child in the womb of Kharija and that this child is a female and so we see that the pious people and those who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they have these thoughts they have this inspiration which we call in Islam is called ilham and so he was able to tell this through that and this baby was born and she was called Umm Kulthum who was the last daughter of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu to be born and in the last moments Aisha radiallahu anha would be saying poetry and this was one of the customs at that time that when someone was passing away they would recite poetry to one another and one of the poems that is narrated in Zawaid al-Zuhud is she says every owner of camels must one day take them to drink and every possessor of plunder must be despoiled basically intending by it how all good things come to an end and upon hearing this Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu he says rather no say this وَجَاءَتْ سَكْرَةُ الْمَوْتِ بِالْحَقِّ ذَلِكَ مَا كُنْتَ مِنْهُ تَحِيدٍ which is an ayah of the Qur'an meaning ultimately with the throes of death will come the truth and that this is what you are trying to escape and then Aisha radiallahu anha she continued reciting poetry in his final moments and poetry praising Abu Bakr Siddiq and this is the sunnah and this is something that we should also implement that when we know someone who is passing away we should meet them and we should say good things to them about them so that they have hope in meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is something that is actually encouraged that we do so she recites the following poetry she says وَأَبْيَدْ يَسْتَسْقَ الْغَمَامُ بِوَجْهِ ثَمَالُ الْيَتَامَ عِدْمَةُ لِلْأَرَامِلِ and a pure one free from faults from whose face the clouds draw drinking water orphans love him a protection for the widows and Abu Bakr Siddiq upon hearing this he says no rather that was the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and we see and we see that even in his final moments he was thinking about his beloved Nabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that even in his final moments he is the one who he was thinking about and so just as he was with him in his life so too was he with him in death and he was buried along with him in the house of Aisha radiallahu anha and now this is the story of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu it took a few parts and I want to end off does anyone have any questions so far The Balagha, which is like narrations from Ali radiallahu anhu, most, honestly, I'd say 90% of them are fabricated. And even they would, even part of their religion is that they, they do not take their hadith to be part of their religion. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Like we say that Bukhari and Muslim, yeah, go ahead. We say that Bukhari and Muslim are part of our religion, that it is part of our sharia, our, our sharia that we derive rulings from it. However, they do not do this. So a lot of their hadith are fabricated pretty much and we know that at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu he was at a different place he was at a place called Qara and so Umar radiallahu anhu he was there so there was not even a way that they could all congregate in that manner and the fact Ali radiallahu anhu he was not immediately there it is not mentioned that he was immediately there when they're appointing the, khali, the next Khalifa 
but rather it was Abu Ubaidah, Amr ibn al-Jarrah, and Umar radiallahu anhu, and they chose Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. However, we must know that even Ali radiallahu anhu, he would agree with this. And because he gave his pledge of allegiance to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And so when they say this narration, it might be, it might be true that maybe Ali wasn't present there, but wherever he was, we know for certain that he would have supported this. Especially, and this is one of the narrations that we get as well, that the Prophet ﷺ says that on my deathbed, one of the reasons I don't choose a next Khalifa, that Aisha radiallahu anha, or one of his wives asked him that why don't you appoint a Khalifa? And he said to him, he said to her that I do not do this because I worry that my ummah would dispute amongst choosing Abu Bakr for the Khilafah. That in his mind he says that this should be something so obvious that I'm afraid to even mention this because it should be so obvious to them that Abu Bakr Siddiq is the leader of the Ummah. What about the, like the, the story of like Rasulullah being in his deathbed and he's like, he wants to write a letter, but then Abu Bakr and Uthman like, they prevent him that from that. Yeah, that's a fabrication. Like, but why do, why are they so like held that on like believing that? It's very, like, Honestly, a lot of their beliefs are like that. They'll choose anything they can get their hands on and stick to it. And honestly, it doesn't make sense at all. Because first of all, if, if Abu Bakr Sadiq, if Umar and Uthman radiallahu anhum did dhulm upon Ali, then why would Ali radiallahu anhu support them, give his bay'ah, work under them as a qadi? And not only this, we know Ali radiallahu anhu, he was a warrior. So why would he still respect someone who did dhulm upon him? Now would he not fight and stand up for himself? And this is how we think of Ali radiallahu anhu. That he was such a man that he would fight for his ideals. And if that's what he truly believed in, that he would have fought for it. But this never happened. And something else is that Ali radiallahu anhu, he named three of his children. And this is fact. And even the Shia know this. He named three of his children, yeah. Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman. And so it honestly doesn't make any sense. I asked that question too, and they justified it as like there were people. Other companions. Yeah, that would. They'll say this, but the thing is, again, the things they say. So one of the things they say about Ali, about Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu and Umar, is that they went to the house of Fatima in order to make Ali give the pledge, and they caused her to have a miscarriage right, I was of the baby. Oh, the baby. Mm -hmm. One thing that like when I was talking to someone about this, they like specifically brought up hadith in um, Bukhari that had like, the, it was like narrating the story but had like mm -hmm. loops and like gaps and voids in between like things that they would fill it in with as in like they would narrate the story but then not put in like, like Fatima died not having given Abu Bakr like her mm -hmm. like, uh, blessing or uh -huh. So this so these are two different hadith. So the hadith of Abu, of Abu Bakr coming to the house of Fatima radiallahu anha and causing a miscarriage, this one is totally fabricated. This is not found anywhere in our transmissions in our six books of hadith. It's not mentioned anywhere. The story about him not speaking to Fatima radiallahu anha, this is about the issue of Fadak I mentioned. And this is in Bukhari. And at the end of it, one of the hadith, the, the hadith mentions that this indeed did happen that after this issue, they did not speak to each other. However, there are scholars that say that this happened because Fatima, she wouldn't really leave the house a lot. And in her illness, she would not leave the house. So there were not many opportunities to meet each other. And then, but there is another narration in the Sunan, in the sunan of Al-Bayhaqi, rahimahullah, in which he narrates a hadith that Abu Bakr Siddiq actually did meet with Fatima radiallahu anha at her deathbed and they made up and they talked over it and how Abu Bakr Sadiq told her that I would prefer my own my, I would prefer the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam over even my own family and they made up with so it. So why, why did she why is there a narration that says that she died without giving like her blessing? So she did give the blessings the hadith that you're talking about it ends off with saying that after they had their talk about Fadak and him not giving her the piece of land, that after this she did not talk to him. What's Fadak? So Fadak was the piece of land that the Prophet ﷺ got as a peace treaty with another tribe. And so Fatima said that we should inherit this. However, the Prophet says that 
I do not leave behind an inheritance. This was how Abu Bakr Sadiq justified not giving her this piece of land. Okay, so it has nothing to do with like the miscarriage or No, it has nothing to do with because the miscarriage, first of all, never happened. And we know this with the story of Ali radiallahu anhu that had this happened to his wife for sure and this is why we respect him more than the Shia. Because the Shia would say that like I guess he was fine with it because he never fought against Abu Bakr. And we would say had this happened, he would have fought against Abu Bakr. He would have met he would have made his opinion, he would have made it heard. That he would have fought in battle against him when this is happening to his wife, literally, and his unborn child. This never happened. And then when you mentioned how they mentioned there's other sahaba with the name of Abu Bakr, then I would say to them there is no one as well known as Abu Bakr Sadiq with the name of Abu Bakr. There is someone they mention. However, let's say it would be similar to, let's say, a Jewish person naming their child Hitler just because there was someone else that they knew who was called Hitler. Because it doesn't make sense. If, if Abu Bakr it indeed did such a dhulm upon Ali, why would he name his children after him? Or even like a name which resembles the name of someone like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, if someone did something so wrong to you, would you really name your child after that person, even like with that connotation in mind? Like, it doesn't make sense. So, like in our like jurisdiction, like if mm -hmm. we believe that like the the Khalifa and like the order that they came like were true, then like that's like we follow like this one up. But if mm -hmm. we like if they don't believe that, then does that make them? Muslim or no? So that question is above my pay grade. So we do say that they were the four righteous Khalifa Abu Bakr Sadiq, Omar Uthman, and Ali. And the order, there because there were disputes early on as well. And the one thing to remember is that even amongst the Shia, the Shia early on were very different from what they are today. Because today their whole aqidah is different that they give their 12 imams to give them like extraordinary powers like they give them supernatural abilities and they say that their imams are infallible like the ayatollah and all them so this for sure takes them outside of the fold of islam however there's zaydi shias which live in yemen and they don't hold these beliefs their only belief is that is in the order like you just mentioned and how it should have been ali before abu Bakr sadiq and so there is like ikhtilaf over this I honestly have not heard of any alim like making blanket takfir over them like saying that they're non-muslim yeah. so I have not heard of that personally but what you're talking about like something even the Shia don't realize their sixth Imam it was Ja'far al-Sadiq yeah. who was a companion of Imam Abu Hanifa who also taught Imam Malik rahimahullah, and he was also a descendant of Abu Bakr al-Sadiq radiallahu anhu so Jafaris who believe in like Imam the one that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the Jafaris don't believe that like they don't believe in like the the succession of the, the, the Jafari it's it's a bit different. So their their Akita is different. I don't know if there's many like even like around nowadays. I know they do exist. I honestly haven't really looked at like their Akita. But it's mentioned even from Ja'far al-Sadiq that his son asked him that what do you think of Abu Bakr al-Sadiq? And so Ja'far al-Sadiq told his son that would someone ever hate his grandfather? And like he wasn't his grandfather, he was like a great great grandfather. But by this he was intending that would, is there any way that someone would not respect Abu Bakr al-Sadiq? And then he told his son that disassociate yourself with anyone who says anything bad about Abu Bakr al-Sadiq. And this is something that's mentioned in our sources, obviously the Shia, they're not going to believe it. But even if you look at the hadith of the Shia, they do not have any chains of narration. Like our hadith, our hadith, they'll have chains of narration and we'll have the biographies of each person that is mentioned in that chain. And like I've honestly looked at the book Balagha, which the Shias follow. They, they literally don't have chains. They make up chains and then they'll just say this narration was attributed to this person. And that's something that's like honestly very big. And that's why we don't really consider their hadith. Mm -hmm.